Hey guys, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study. Thanks for tuning in again. Um, we're looking at the issue of nations in our Eschatology 101 series. Or if you clicked on the End, End Times 101 series, you're also at the correct place. Um, today we're looking at the Antichrist Kingdom. So we've we've kind of danced around the issue of the end times in in able in order to lay a foundation. This this time we're going to actually start to reveal where it is in eschatology that this starts to fall into place. So the Antichrist Kingdom. Uh, first of all, let's ask the question: What is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is false Christ, the one who calls himself Christ and is not. Uh, that which is Antichrist is not simply opposed to Christ. It might not be opposed to Jesus. It, But it calls itself Jesus and is not Jesus. So the Antichrist kingdom... This is this is the area of eschatology. Uh, we we're starting to dive into some of the more um, rudimentary things now. We've built up to this point. Now we're actually starting to dive into the end times fairly significantly in the last few segments. Um, here with the Antichrist kingdom, what we're going to look at here. Uh, a lot of people want to know where's the Antichrist come from. I'm not going to. I'm not going to answer that. We might we might brush on it. There are hints given, but in all honesty, it's not that important. Uh, what is more important is to understand that the Antichrist kingdom is actually already established upon the earth. If we can see the larger picture and then come to the smaller details, the smaller details make a lot more sense. So what do I mean when I say the Antichrist kingdom is already established upon the earth? I mean that there is a continuum from the city of Enoch before the flood that Cain built in Genesis chapter 4, that, has, uh, that, that is the root from where Babel comes from in Genesis 11. Babel is in the plains of Shinar. Shinar is sometimes the word given for Babylon in the prophets. So you have Babel, to Babylon. At the end of the age, in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, this woman who rides the beast, which we all assume is going to be this Antichrist kingdom, this is the beast, right? It's given the name Babylon. So there's a connection here, there's a continuum here, there's, a, there's an unbroken chain that links from this to this to this to this to this through the whole Old Testament into the New Testament and onward to the end of the age. So the Antichrist kingdom is actually already established upon the earth. The question is, is the Antichrist kingdom established upon the earth in that final way? Let me see if I can explain. Though the Antichrist is not manifest, there is a place that Satan has placed his name upon, Babylon. There's a continuum from Genesis 10, 8 through 12, through Revelation 17 and 18. I've already, I've already mentioned it, it actually stems even before that into uh, Enoch, the city Enoch. Genesis 10, 8 shows Nimrod, the father of Babylon, and at the end of the age, the kingdom be, uh, being expressed is called Babylon. Though it isn't on the map, Babel, it, I don't think there's going to be a... a resurgence of Babylon. I don't I don't think people are going to build it back up and say this is where we're going to rule from. I don't think that's what we're supposed to be looking for. Uh, I, I do think though, even presently, Babylon is a present reality. Satan has still placed his name upon Babylon and whether it transfer from this one to that one to that one to that one, once again I'll get into what I'm talking about with transferring. Uh, though it might might go from this chain to that chain to that chain, it's still the kingdom of darkness. Apparently it's not. Yeah. My button's not working to be able to go down, so 
forgive me for, for forgive the clicks. <laughs> um, so in Daniel chapter two, I'm going to open up my Bible because it doesn't look like I've written this out. So Daniel chapter two, there's a story that we're entering into with this, where the king Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he's not able to interpret it. The dream actually bothers him quite quite a bit. And he asks all of the the astrologers and the magicians and everybody who he can go to, <clears throat> he asks them, please interpret this dream. Nobody's able to interpret it. And in fact, if I remember right, he actually uh, he actually even says, I'm not going to tell you the dream. That way I know that your interpretation is correct. And everybody says, well, you, we can't interpret it if you don't tell us. And Daniel does what, what is considered the impossible and tells the king his dream and the interpretation. What's the dream? If you go to Daniel chapter 2, and you look at... I guess it starts in verse 20, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, somewhere around here. Um, the dream that's given, ah, here, verse 31, <laughs> sorry, the dream that's given, it says, Oh, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while the stone was while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's the whole dream. I believe that, that we need to go into the actual texts when we're dealing with this. Um, I've, I've been listening recently to some other people and they just kind of reference the text and I've realized how dangerous that is. So uh, for those of you who already know this, bear with me. <clears throat> There's a statue with a golden head, Daniel, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse... Yeah, verse 38 the very end of the verse, it says, uh, God has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Right at the very end of the verse, Daniel says, you, Nebuchadnezzar, are this head of gold. So we have the golden head being Babylon. The silver chest is the kingdom that comes after them, as we see in, in verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. So you have, so you have here, I, I'm giving you what these represent. You have Babylon was given as the first one. You can see in the book of Daniel in chapter 6, who is it that conquers Babylon? It's Medo-Persia. So Medo-Persia is the, the kingdom that rises up afterwards. Well, who is it that, that takes down Medo-Persia? Well, we have that answered to us in chapter 11, but ultimately this is, this is going to be given to us in the history books. It's Greece, specifically Alexander. And when we get to chapter 7, when we get to Daniel 7, um, I'm going to explain that. I guess 7 and 8. I'm going to explain how we can come to that conclusion pretty easily. Uh, the bronze adamant, ad, 
abdomen would be uh, it would be Greece with Alexander, and then the iron legs that's Rome. Now I've heard some who would say the iron legs are actually the Ottoman Empire with the Muslims. I I don't I don't think that's correct, and the reason is because the prophecies in Daniel all have dual implications and dual fulfillments. All of them. When did Jesus come to establish the kingdom? It was during the Roman rule. Specifically, there, there were two, two kind of Roman kingdoms, if you will. Um, the one was ruled by the, the proconsul. The other had the Caesar. And when you broke from the proconsul to the Caesar, now you're entering into the feet of iron and clay. That's when Jesus comes. However, <laughs> this is the dual fulfillment thing. With Jesus coming in that first century, were the nations broken into pieces? Did God, did God cause for this statue to shatter, to, to completely be obliterated and, and be blown away by the wind? No. So we're looking for a future time then that this that this would happen. We're looking then for a future time where this statue, this kingdom of darkness, would be taken away. It would be shattered. And that happens at the return of Jesus. Daniel chapter 7, we'll get into this later. Uh, it, it also has a dual fulfillment. Where the it's it's this little horn is the Antichrist, this little horn's thrown into the lake of fire at the coming of the of the Son of Man on the clouds. Well, did Jesus come in the clouds? No. But when you read the text in Daniel chapter 7, it looks like the ascension more than more than anything. It looks like the ascension with, with Jesus ascending, there is this. However, when you read Daniel chapter 7, that cannot be fulfilled. There's too much there that is still in play. So that we expect, just like the angel said, the way that you saw Jesus go, he's going to return. He left on the cloud, he'll return on the cloud. When he returns, there will be the Antichrist thrown into the lake of fire, according to Revelation chapter 19. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and wait on it instead of going through all of them like that. Um, but there, there are these dual fulfillments where you have, there, there's, there's a fulfillment in Christ's first coming. And so we do have an expression of the kingdom here and now, a tangible expression even. But there's a more final and a more ultimate and, and an exacting fulfillment at the end of the age with Jesus' second coming. And that, that's, the big, that's the big confusion usually. Some people will, will look at it and say, well, these, these have been fulfilled, because look at, look at how all these things line up. And they'll say, well, if it's fulfilled, then I guess it's done. But it's not done, because <laughs> it's prophetic, so therefore it's always eternal. It's always uh, immediate and imminent. It's always something that... that um, how do, I, how do I, it always affects the here and now because it is an eternal word. It is an eternal proclamation. So even if it were to be fulfilled, it's not obsolete. So, there's a real sense in which this was fulfilled with Jesus' first coming, but the fulfillment of the dream means the breaking of the kingdoms so that God's kingdom is all that is left. That has not happened. And that's what I want to get at. As we continue through this, we're going to uh, we're going to get deeper and deeper and deeper into this. Note, it is all one statue, even if several different parts. You have you have a few different elements mentioned. You have gold, you have silver, bronze, iron, and then iron and clay. So you have five different elements, five different components to this statue, and yet it's all one statue. All of these nations are connected in one manner. They are manifestations of the kingdom of darkness. And this is what I was getting at earlier with the transitioning thing. 
the Antichrist kingdom is established upon the earth, it has been for a long time. It started with the city Enoch, it came with Babel, it eventually progressed unto Babylon. Babylon is destroyed by Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia is now the kingdom of darkness, destroyed by Greece, Greece is now the kingdom of darkness, destroyed by Rome, now Rome is the kingdom of darkness. Rome continues through, whether, whether you want to say it, it continues through the Roman Catholic Church, or whether you want to say that, that Rome continues through the ideology that they brought forth, um, that both the Greeks and the Romans, their, their ideology, their, their lifestyle, their mindset, is very much the, the mindset of the world today. Whichever way you want to look at it, I don't, I don't really care too much. But there, there is still the continuation. This is true of the four beasts in Daniel seven. We're gonna get there. If you don't know, if you don't know Daniel very deeply, we'll get there, and I'm gonna read it so that you can understand. Um, the four beasts that are mentioned in Daniel seven. If you compare them to Revelation thirteen one and two, you find the Antichrist is a hybrid of the four beasts. The animals represent Babylon, Medo-Persia, Bear, um, Greece, and Rome. Am I not even... Okay, so I'm not even... Let me go ahead and read Daniel 7. Um, it would have been much smarter for me to have uh, tried to map this out and actually put the texts up for you. Okay, so Daniel 7... <sighs> In Daniel chapter, when we read Ch Daniel chapter two, we had the five elements on the on the statue. Notice with Daniel chapter seven, there are four beasts, four elements, and then the fifth was iron and clay with the feet. With the um, with Daniel seven, there will be four beasts, and then the little horn grows off of the fourth beast, just like iron and clay with feet, little horn off the fourth beast. Okay. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted from, up from the earth, and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side, and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, and had it, it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, like breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little horn, coming up out from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking with pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. For as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. 
I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. So, Daniel 2. Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Four kingdoms. Daniel 7. Four beasts. Four beasts, four kingdoms. How do I know that these are the correct ones? You have Babylon, the lion, because... It shows here, the lion had eagle's wings, and I watched until they were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. When you go back to Daniel chapter 4, by the way, as I'm flipping through, I realize um, Daniel chapter 5 is where Medo-Persia uh, conquers Babylon. I was wrong. I said chapter 6. It's chapter 5. Um, in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has a second dream, and Daniel explains the dream that, that this tree that was cut down is, is Nebuchadnezzar, and, and God's going to cut him down and cause him to go out into the wilderness, and he's going to eat grass like the animals. And, and it, it says, where is that exactly? Verse 33, that very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And you have here this lion had eagle's wings until the wings were t plucked off. And it was lifted, and this beast was lifted up from the earth to make to stand on two feet like a man, and the man's heart was given to it. Just like at the end of this humiliation of Nebuchadnezzar, he is picked up and made to stand on his two feet again. He's able to cut his hair, he's able to live like a man instead of a beast anymore. I mean, this is this is a reiteration of, of Nebuchadnezzar's story, right here, just in a small detail. Once again, what kingdom, what world kingdom came after Babylon? Medo-Persia. The bear, it's raised up on one side because the Medes were not as strong as the Persians. It had uh, three ribs in its mouth because Medo-Persia had three great conquests. I'm hoping that I get into this later because I don't remember all of the dates. The, um, the, the leopard here, which represents Greece, had the four wings, and it had the four, uh, the four heads. When you, um, when you look in chapter 8 with the, with the, the goat and the ram, the goat has one horn, that horn eventually falls off, and then you have uh, four horns spring up in its place. The four here represents the four kingdoms of Greece, that Greece... Eventually, after after Alexander died, went to the four uh, top chief officials of Alexander, and so it was divided into four pieces. Um, Rome being the fourth beast, I can you can connect this. Let's see where is where was that in chapter two? I have a new Bible, and so I'm not I don't have all of this highlighted anymore. Let's see. Verse forty uh, two. Daniel 2.40, In the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Daniel 7, verse 7, After this I saw in the night, and behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, like the iron was exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. Once again, there's the iron. It was devouring, breaking in pieces. There's that language of breaking in pieces again. 
in trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from the all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. The ten horns, I'm sure you're thinking immediately to Revelation chapter uh, 12 with the, what, with the red dragon that had ten horns. I think that's verse 3. Or to Revelation 13, talking about how this beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13 also has ten horns. Or to Revelation 17, the ten horns of the beast. I, I'm sure that this is immediately what you think of. And you should. <laughs> um, and I would like to add to that, when you go back to Daniel chapter 2, when giving the... Um, when giving the the explanation of the dream, you have in Daniel two forty two, uh, and as the to as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fra fragile. Skip to verse skip to verse forty four. And in the in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to the other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. What's he saying? The the these kings, I don't believe, goes back to all of the elements. I think that he focuses in on the toes for a reason. There are ten toes, and in the days of these kings, these ten toes, these ten kings, ten horns, ten kings, ten toes, ten kings, there's... There's this 10 that's repeating here. Okay, I've spent a lot of time on this, I know. Um, but I, I think it's necessary to actually open up the scripture to read it to you. So Rome is also the kingdom in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that is mixed with clay. In Daniel 7, the contrast between Rome and the Antichrist kingdom are not distinguished. You have the kingdom of iron and, and clay in Daniel 2. In Daniel 7, there's beast, and then this little horn grows on the beast. That's what I'm getting at. There's no separation, there's no fifth beast, so to speak. Similarly, in Isaiah 14 and in Ezekiel 28, uh, they're addressing literal kings, but you come to a certain point where we wonder if the kings are being addressed or if it's Satan. Um, Isaiah 14 is one of those passages that I'm sure most of you already know, where, uh, where the prophet is mocking this Lucifer, who said, I will ascend, and I will be like the Most High. You know, Every time that he says, I will, it's, it's one step higher, just pumping himself up. Uh, Ezekiel 28, we're talking about the king of Tyre, and next thing you know, he, uh, the prophet, I guess God, through the prophet, is declaring, you were in the Garden of Eden, you, had, you were the most beautiful of all the cherubs, and you start to think to yourself, wait a second, is this, is this the king of Tyre, or is this... Satan, I mean, this can't be the king of Tyre. He wasn't in the Garden of Eden. He wasn't walking through the sacred mountains. He wasn't He wasn't a cherub. What is happening is the connection between the heavenly reality of the principalities and the earthly reality of a nation that is co the corresponding counterpart. Do you get what I'm saying? There's a connection between the principalities, uh, the heavenly rulers, uh, which are demonic rulers, and then the, the earthly rulers of nations. There's a, a connection between the two. Interesting. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. When you go to Zechariah 119, once again, I'm going to turn there so that you have this read to you. I know it's taking up a lot of extra time to do this, but I'm hoping for those of you who don't have these things memorized like I do, and like I know others do, I'm hoping this is helpful to actually read it. Zechariah 119. I'm going to read verse 18. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who was talking with me, What are these horns? So he answered me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Okay, so what what are these different horns? These are different nations. You have in uh, Daniel 7, the ten horns represent ten kings. And 
Revelation 17, the ten horns represent ten kings. Here you've got four horns representing the different nations, the different kings that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Who are these? Once again, we're given the exact same mystery. The tower was in the plains of Shinar, which is Babylon. The connection between the Antichrist and Satan is not so much about Satan becoming incarnate as it is a full representation of the kingdom of darkness made manifest upon the earth. Who were these horns? Well, who are the nations that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem? Egypt did not. Although, um, you can look at history, you see Babel, or Babylon, when Babylon came, uh, Israel went into exile, so Babylon is one. Um, the Assyrians, they were the ones who, who took northern Israel into exile, and you also have Rome, that when Titus came in 70 AD and destroyed uh, Jerusalem, or conquered Jerusalem, this is when, when they scattered again. So you have three, three kingdoms here, Babylon, Assyria, and Rome, but who's the fourth? Well, we can, we can know from Bible prophecy that there's going to come a time when Israel is scattered a final time, and after that final scattering, they are going to be brought back to the land. They cannot be scattered if they're not in the land. So Hitler is not the fourth horn. The scattering specifically has to be an exile out of the land that they possess. They now possess the land. But they did not in Hitler's time, in 1930s and 40s. So the scattering, this fourth scattering, has to be future with the Antichrist. You see how I came to that conclusion? I, I hope so, because I, I can't tell if you, you're following or not. So Daniel 7, let's, let's stick here again. Um, a little horn comes up on the fourth beast. We if you remember me reading that. The little horn represents the Antichrist. In all of Daniel's prophecies, the little horn represents the Antichrist. Uh, the beast has a similar description to the dragon in Revelation 12, and then the Antichrist in Revelation 13 and 17. This little horn is the Antichrist. When you compare, by the way, when you compare Revelation 12 the description given to the dragon, verse 3 here, Revelation 12, 3, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. Go to Revelation 13, verse... Uh, we'll, get, we'll go ahead and start in verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. The be now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. So, I read all of that because I want you to see the connection of the four animals that were mentioned in chapter 7. Now we have the, the same animals being described as this Antichrist in Revelation 13. You have the dragon in, in chapter 12 has seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns, or seven diadems on his heads. The beast, however, uh, the, the Antichrist, however, has seven heads and ten horns, but ten crowns on his horns. So you have a difference here between the two. And I, I think that's necessary to note that there is a difference between the dragon and the Antichrist, even though they're described similarly. The prophecies of Daniel should be viewed side by side so that when we see chapter 2, we should also see chapter 7 as being an add-on to chapter 2. Daniel 8 should be adding on to the details of Daniel 7, Daniel 9 adding on the details, and Daniel 11 and 12 adding on more details. We, we shouldn't see this as being uh, separate 
prophecies entirely. All of these add on to one another and come together to give you a big, big, big picture. What is mentioned in chapter 2 corresponds with chapter 7. The four metals and the four beasts are the same thing. Then in Daniel 8, we have another reiteration. There's a ram in Daniel chapter 8 with two horns and a goat with one horn. Let me go ahead and just read the passage. Take up some more time. Uh, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. To me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me in the first, or at the first. What's the one that was at the first? That's Daniel chapter 7. I saw in the vision, uh, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is the province, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted my eyes and I saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. The bear had was lifted up on one side. Here we see the two horns. One is taller than the other. Uh, so, th so you can see how this is connected. The ram. That's it is a ram. Right? Yeah, the ram. <laughs> sorry, the ram is Medo-Persia. The same as the um, the bear in Daniel chapter 7. Then, as you continue, I saw the ram pushing, for, pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Three, three ribs, three conquests, westward, northward, and southward. Verse 5. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground. The, and, the, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with a furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. There's a lot happening here. Remember, in Daniel 2, there were two, t two details given. First of all, uh, the, the Nebuchadnezzar, the gold head, when, when Daniel said, the next one shall be silver, because silver is inferior to gold, so shall the kingdom be inferior. A ram is a lot stronger than a goat. A goat will be taken down by a ram, no problem. And yet here it is the opposite, that the goat is the one that takes down the ram. So you have a kingdom inferior, and yet it's the one who takes down uh, the, the more... Um, the, the better of the two. Also, you see in the detail here in verse um, in verse 7, there was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. There was this trampling in, in chapter 7 of the, of the fourth beast, and there was the trampling uh, mentioned in, in chapter 2 of that, that kingdom of iron. Here, you see this ram who was Greece, this one horn being Alexander. You have, you have uh, this this fourth um, beast in Daniel seven is now suddenly uh, coalescing with the second animal in Daniel eight. So you have Greece, even though Greece is the one that's being mentioned, it's Greece that is actually being expanded to being the fourth beast in the fourth element as well. This, this once again, it comes back to the continuum. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 line up perfectly. Daniel 8 only has two animals. One's Medo-Persia, the other's Greece. There's no debate on that. However, as we continue reading, you're going to see there's, there are, there's a little horn that's going to grow up. Well, let, me, let me go ahead and read and you can, you can find, figure this out. Therefore the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of its 
uh, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Four four wings and four heads on the on the four, on the third beast. Here we have four horns. Uh, so Daniel five eight five through eight is a representation of the four kings that ruled after Alexander. When Alexander passed away, the four mightiest men were supposed to take his place. So Greece was divided into four sections. These are the four horns that grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Uh, once again, in Daniel 8, we find a little horn. This little horn grows, to, grows on one of the four horns. So I'll read in verse 9 where that is. And out of one of the four horns came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the most, some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of the desolation and the giving of, the, of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled under foot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Once again, a lot of details, right? And you're probably wondering, what the heck is going on here? Let's back up again. This, um, this little horn grows on one of the four horns. Uh, which, which horn does it grow up on? Okay. Um... When you look at the, the four kingdoms of Greece, there's only two that this little horn could be growing off of because you see in verse 9 here, uh, he grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Only what we would modernly modern day call Greece would it, would it be acceptable to say towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land, which would be Israel, only there or in Turkey. All of the other, the other two kingdoms of, of the Greeks is either south already or it's east already, and there's, that's silly to then, to, to then claim that that's where the Antichrist is going to come out of. So, which one? I'm not going to get into any of the details. I'm not going to try to debate it, but there's your little tidbit. There's your hint. <laughs> um, this segment is not the segment to get into lengthy discourse on the Antichrist and what he does. Uh, we will venture into that later. For now, we focus upon the kingdom that Satan has placed his name upon. So I'm going to later get into Daniel 9, 11, and 12 and discuss a lot more lengthily uh, how we can identify the Antichrist. However, now now is the time. I'm just trying to show you the connection that you have in Daniel 2, 7, and 8. There's a connection and an interconnection between the kingdom of darkness ruled by Satan and these physical kingdoms on the earth. Babylon was the first representation of that kingdom, and it then was captured by Medo-Persia. It, uh, it was while being ruled over by the Persians that the message came to Daniel that the prince of Persia delayed the angel. That's Daniel 10.13. That Daniel was fasting and his prayer was heard, but the angels to come to, to counsel David to give him the, his answer, it was delayed by the prince of Persia. Who is this prince of Persia? Uh, Okay, so who is the Prince of Persia? <laughs> um, to wave our hand and say that, it, that who is being described here as the earthly ruler of Persia doesn't cut it. It leaves too many open-ended questions. For example, what makes more sense? 
is to say the Prince of Persia is actually a demon or Satan himself. Uh, one of the open-ended questions would be, how is it that this earthly king has the ability to affect angels? Why don't the angels just go right past him? No, it makes more sense to say that the, that the Prince of Persia is actually a demon or Satan himself. We then read again in Daniel 10.20 that after the angel leaves, the Prince of Greece would come. Once again, it makes more sense to say that these are demonic rulers in the heavenly realm. Satan has placed his name upon Babylon and has caused for an unbroken continuum through the ages. At the end of the age, when the Antichrist will be defeated by the return of Jesus, we, will, we find that Revelation 17 through 17 and 18 describe the Antichrist kingdom as Babylon. So even though Babylon has been destroyed, we find at the very end of the Bible, Babylon. Why? The seven heads in Revelation 17 are seven hills. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and one is to come. I'm quoting Revelation 17 here. This is a mystery. and In fact, John even says this is a great mystery. Uh, when that seventh king does come, he will remain only for a little while. It's even said... What just happened? It's even said that um, this seventh king will also be an eighth. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> Logic tells us the seventh king is the Antichrist. The passage makes no sense otherwise. It is of him that the riddle is given, that he once was, now is not, and will be an eighth. The Antichrist will be another Nebuchadnezzar. Now that doesn't mean his name is going to be Nebuchadnezzar, nor that he's going to restore Babylon. But like John the Baptist was Elijah, this man will have the same kind of authority and glory as Nebuchadnezzar. Can you comprehend that? Um, so, what is it that's happening here in Revelation 17, 9, and 10? Let me, let me just turn there once again, just so that you guys aren't stuck going, whoa, whoa, what, what? Let me read it. Revelation 17, 9 and 10. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. What are the seven kings? What are the, what are the seven heads? Well... I want, to, I want to point out two things. One, when you go through Daniel chapter 7 and you look at the animals that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, the lion has one head, the bear has one head. The leopard has four heads. One and one is two and four is six. The fourth beast has one head. That's seven So, we're looking at those set, those four kingdoms. We're looking at Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. However, with, with, I brought up Zechariah, four, um, Zechariah 1 earlier with these four horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. When you add in what's been lost, or when you add in the, the other two that were not mentioned before, um, you've got... Egypt and Assyria, which is seven, which is six, I'm sorry, which is six. So you've got Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the last, the seventh, which is also an eighth, is the Antichrist. Note Jeremiah 51, 25. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys all the earth, says the Lord, and I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the rocks, and make you a burnt mountain. Zechariah 4.7 also has some pertinence here. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. You see here, these two mountains, uh, mountains are kingdoms and not simply kings. 
John is pulling from this, expecting his readers to do their homework. These are the seven kingdoms that oppressed the people Israel, and the seven kings can, spe can be specifically noted. Pharaoh of Exodus, Assyria captured Israel, Nebuchadnezzar, conquered, conqueror of Babylon, Alexander, and Augustus Caesar. We're at five. What about Medo-Persia, Greece? Let's see where Pharaoh, Assyria, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander, and Augustus. Okay, so what about what about Medo-Persia? We're going to specifically assume that we're talking about the one in, in, that's mentioned in, in Daniel chapter 5, uh, whoever it was that would have conquered Belshazzar. And then the last one would be the Antichrist, which Revelation chapter 11 calls the beast that comes out of the abyss. Chapter uh, 13, it's this hybrid, this beast that comes up out of the sea. And later the false prophet is the one that comes out of the earth. Um, in Revelation 17, you have the woman who sits upon the beast, the beast being the Antichrist. You have in chapter 19, Jesus returns and destroys the beast and the false prophet and throws them into the lake of fire. All the same person. The little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and 8. Why Augustus and not Titus or Nero? Um, for those of you who have done a little bit of studying in the end times, you'll know that some people are going to put in Revelation chapter 13, they're going to say that's Nero. I'm, I'm saying Augustus because it was during Augustus' reign that Jesus was born, according to Luke. When, so, so here's the thing. We like to think of Titus because Titus is the one who led the expedition to destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. We like to think of Nero because Nero was one of the great persecutors in, in the first century. And many people put Nero as the man, as the beast in Revelation 13. I think that's wrong. But um, because I don't see Revelation 13 or 17 as being... Uh, a past historical figure. I see it as a future person. I don't think Titus or Nero need to fit the bill. I think that it's Augustus because it's in Augustus's reign that Jesus was born. And that's important because, like I mentioned at the very beginning, there's this kind of dual fulfillment thing happening uh, where where you have out of out of the the um, what is it? in Daniel eight, you have the fulfillment of Daniel 8 in Antiochus Epiphanes. However, you don't have the fulfillment of Daniel 8 in Antiochus Epiphanes. He doesn't fit the bill. All of what's prophesied in Daniel 8, when you go back and read it, I know I didn't read the whole chapter. When you go back and you read it and you look at everything that's supposed to happen, Antiochus did not fulfill that. Same thing with Daniel 11. Antiochus did not fulfill that to a T. We're looking at something else. We're looking at another future event. If, if we're wanting to say that prophecy, is, that if well, let me put it this way. If we want to say that the Bible is inspired and it's infallible, it's inerrant either way, inerrant or infallibility. If we want to say that the Bible is inerrant, we cannot say that Antiochus is the one who fulfills Daniel 8 or Daniel 11. Same thing here. So, Jesus was born in Augustus's time. That's that's the that's the main point that I'm driving home is because there's a dual fulfillment and that needs to be the case. Uh, it it should be enough to list the nations and allow the details to sort themselves out. But because these texts are so heatedly debated, I want to attempt to give as much reason for why I say what I do. So many have attempted to interpret these texts and usually without any background information. Uh, a whim is as good as as good a reason as any. What am I trying to get at? I, I've I've heard people who discuss this a lot. And a lot of times when they discuss the mark of the beast, who is the Antichrist, where does the Antichrist come, uh, who's the woman who's riding the scarlet uh, scarlet beast, when when people start discussing these things, so often it's just crazy. The Catholic Church is the woman who rides the Scarlet Beast. Well, why would you say that? Well, because they, they look like it. Yeah, but 
the Catholic religion didn't exist in John's time. Well, it doesn't have to. Well, yeah, it does. Otherwise, it doesn't have any pertinence whatsoever at all to who John's writing to. Well, if you put it as a future Antichrist, it doesn't have any pertinence either. Of course it does. Um, by the way, I think that the... Well, I don't need to get into that. Um, whatever we, whatever we, we say that these symbols represent, there has to be some sort of an immediate understanding that the first century can take, and they can say, oh, that makes sense. This is, this is going to affect them, and it's going to affect us today at the same time. Preterism with, or preterism, however you want to say it, um, where it says everything was fulfilled in the past, yeah, it affects them, but it has no bearing whatsoever to us. And that, that's one of my big contentions. Um, Revelation 17, 12. Let's see, did I read that verse? No. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beasts. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. So we have in, in Revelation 17, 12, the ten horns. The ten horns upon the fourth beast of Daniel 7 are also described as ten kings. We find the same mention of ten kings in Daniel 2.42 and 2.44. Just like with the Tower of Babel, these ten kings that I put here in my notes, all nations, but I'm gonna I'm going to refrain from that and say these ten kings will submit unto Babylon and worship the beast. And you see Revelation 13, 8, it does say, let me go ahead and read it once again, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Revelation 13, 8, all those who dwell on the earth will worship him, those whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Um, when you're dealing with the book of Revelation, there are, there's polarities. There are those who are in heaven and those who are the inhabitants of the earth. So you have those, you have kind of a polarity here. Those of Babylon, those who worship the beast, those are the inhabitants of the earth. Those who follow God are those who dwell in heaven. As it was at the beginning with the Tower of Babel where all nations come together so that they might not be scattered, so it shall be at the end. For God has established the end from the beginning. Many scriptures refer to a king or kingdom that comes to its end, but history doesn't match it. We also find prophecies that sound like the Antichrist, but the context isn't the Antichrist. These passages about Moab, Tyre, Egypt, etc. are part of the continuum of Daniel 2. When you read in Isaiah about the king of Assyria, oftentimes the Assyrian in, in Isaiah is, uh, is doing anti, uh, Antichrist things. Yeah, there's an immediate context where the Antichrist is the fulfillment, but there's also a, a, a fulfillment beyond the Assyrian. In Ezekiel chapter 28, it's talking about the king of Tyre, yes, but it's also going beyond just the king of Tyre. And later in Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel 30, where it talks about Egypt. Yeah, it's about Egypt and Pharaoh, but it's, it goes beyond Egypt and Pharaoh. This is part of the continuum, that when you read the prophets and they start to speak these words and you start to think, wait a second, that sounds a lot like what the Antichrist is supposed to do. Most likely, you can take this as a pattern and say, this had immediate application and bearing to these kings, but there is also an end times understanding that we can pull from this. There is a sense of immediacy fulfilled in their day, but yet they also go past their day to an ultimate fulfillment in the Antichrist. And that's, that's the thing, that's one of the missing keys. That's one of the things that we need to understand if we're going to continue in the end times and the study of the end times. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 7 speak of a man of sin and a mystery of iniquity. Uh, these ones I'm not going to go to and read. Um, I, I assume that you've probably heard of that if you're even watching this. Um, the man of sin is the Antichrist, and the mystery of iniquity is the very thing that I've been expressing. 
what degree are the nations manipulated and manifesting a demonic spirit? When we can see the patterns, we can better interpret the prophetic texts. We're no longer bound by strict plastic interpretations. The mystery of iniquity is that you have these nations that are under the usurping and they're under the influence of the demonic spirits. And the mystery of iniquity is expressed in the man of sin because the man of sin, the Antichrist, is where there is no restraint anymore. This is a man who is so unified with Satan that you almost have an unholy trinity. You have Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist all mentioned together, working together. You have um, the man of sin doing everything that Satan would desire because it's a man it's a manifestation of the wisdom of Satan in the flesh. This is um this is a man who is engulfed. This is uh, this is the mystery being expressed because it reveals to us the extent to which uh, nations are being manipulated. That's the mystery. That's the mystery of iniquity. It, it's this um, continuum from from Enoch, the city Enoch in Genesis 4, all the way through to the end of the age with the, the beast and the ten kings and all of it. That's the mystery of iniquity. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop here and I'm just going to hope and pray that you've uh, been able to comprehend and follow me because I'm, as I as I've gone through it, I'm I'm going to admit to you I'm I'm hoping that this wasn't as scatterbrained and as uh, all over as I feel like it was. Uh, if I if I were to just open it up and do it um, without notes, I think that I would have done it in a much cleaner way. Um, until next time, grace and peace to you in Christ, and we're going to pick up next time with. Uh, the prophetic purposes of nations. Thanks for listening.